I'm Richard Feldman. So I had no idea that I was going to be this well set up, but as it turns out, um, Mark's awesome talk earlier about CSS modules, at the end of it, he talked about the idea of what if you had a CSS preprocessor where the language was JavaScript? You could just write JavaScript code and then have it output a CSS file. That's what this is, except Elm code instead of JavaScript. Uh, and we'll see why that's awesome in a second. Um, this is just a proof of concept. This is not production ready, but it totally works. So here we have the uh, beautiful Reactive 2015 website, except that I rewrote the header styles in Elm style sheets. So that's what this looks like. This is all just pure vanilla Elm code. Um, I made a little DSL using the fact that you can write custom operators in Elm. So we have got header, nav, uh, nav link is a class. So we've got a little dot to indicate that it's a class. Got a pound side for Reactive logo, so that's an ID, and another ID for buy tickets. So the, one of the first things that you want with any um, good CSS preprocessors, you want the ability to use variables for code reuse. So let's look at this background color attribute here. So that's for this buy tickets button. We've got this nice green on the background. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull that out and rename that to reactive green. OK, and then I'm going to pull that up here and say reactive green equals. OK, cool. And uh, I'm actually going to use that to give these links the same color. So I'm going to go down to my nav link class and replace its color with reactive green. Recompile it. Elm compiler is super fast. Boom, green links. Cool, OK. Um, oh, thanks. Um, that's encouraging, because I haven't gotten to the cool stuff yet. Um, <laughs> OK, so uh, we did the bare minimum. Um, but we could have done that in JavaScript. That's something that any CSS preprocessor can do. How about this? Let's do something that we can't see in uh, JavaScript as a preprocessor. Um, let's change background color to background color and rerun that again. Naming error. Cannot find variable background color. It actually gives us a little red underline under the thing that's broken, a line number. Maybe you want one of the following, background color. Um, so I didn't write this. This is just Elm's compiler. Elm's compiler is just this awesome. And when you write stuff in Elm, your life is this awesome. Um, <laughs> Uh, which is why when we switched from uh, React to Elm at No Red Ink in production, um, we basically just stopped getting runtime exceptions from our Elm code because the compiler is just really good at catching this stuff. And it would be awesome if we could get that in our style sheets as well. Um, another cool thing. So let's say I change padding from 12 pixels to LOL pixels. What is that going to do? Type mismatch. Padding LOL pixels. Function padding is expecting the first argument to be number, but it is a string. So again, it's not just miss, you know, uh, Making typos, it's also type mismatches. Um, again, this is just a thing that happens with the Elm compiler, and it's just the fact that I wrote this in Elm means that I get this for free. It's pretty awesome. Um, it's kind of weird to me that I've heard you know, a number of times at the conference uh, people talking about Elm and the Elm architecture and how it's inspiring lots of cool tools. But from my perspective, the coolest part about Elm is the stuff that you can't get in JavaScript, namely the compiler that's just got your back and just saves you from all these errors reaching your end users. Um, one more thing. So at the end of Mark's awesome talk, Andre asked a question, uh, which was, what about constant sharing? Which is a great question. Uh, let's look at how that works in this land. So we've got over here a view. Uh, this is what's actually rendering this using uh, Elm's little DSL for uh, virtual DOM stuff. So it's the same kind of idea as React, except instead of JSX, it's just more pure Elm. Um, OK, so let's say I want to change Reactive logo to just logo. So I change it to logo. And I compile it, and it says, ah, cannot find variable logo. OK, cool. So it knew that in the view, uh, logo was no longer a thing. And that's because we've got this, uh, this constants file here, and I didn't update it over here. So we have all of our CSS IDs, and I forgot to update it. OK, now I updated it in the constants file, so we're good, right? No, we're not, because the style sheet is using that same constants file. And the compiler will tell you if you mess it up and you don't keep them in sync. So now that little pound reactive logo definition knows about the fact that uh, we didn't have that. So if I update that, now it will compile. I refresh the page, and now I look at this guy. We can see that it is now ID logo. And the style here is coming not from inline styles, but from our actual style sheet using that pound logo that was automatically generated. So uh, using this, uh, and this goes the other way too, by the way. Um, so if I update it uh, over here, but um, if I make it so that the, the view is trying to reference something that no longer exists in the other two, same issue. So they have to all be in sync. So what this means is that you can now live in a world where when you want to go and delete a CSS class or a CSS ID that you don't think you're using anymore, the compiler will actually tell you if you're using it somewhere. It'll give you an error if you deleted that and it's still being referenced somewhere. Awesome. That's something I've wanted in CSS for years. And this is a proof of concept that it can actually be done. If you have any other questions, I'm RT Feldman on Twitter, and uh, come see me. Thanks.